Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you are all well and welcome to the next installment in Armagh City, Banbridge and Craig Avonborough Council's Enterprise Week. I'm Kevin Kelly from Podium and my job today is to put your questions and my own to our two outstanding speakers. So to submit a question, please use the, the Q&A button at the, the bottom of your screen. And don't forget to include your name and organization before your question so that we can give you a little bit of profile as well. We would also encourage you to tweet about today's event. And you'll see as part of my high tech backdrop here uh, that I have included in my very best handwriting, the hashtag and some uh, relevant Twitter handles. So the hashtag is ABCEW20. That's ABCEW for Enterprise Week 20. And the Twitter handles are at ABCB underscore council, at PKFFPM, at We Are Madlog, and at Fibrous Full Fiber. Now, at the end of the event, you will be asked to complete the attendee evaluation survey, and we would be most grateful if you would take two minutes to give us your feedback. This is this is crucial for us and for the council uh, to create the right events for you in, in the future. Now, as we all know, streaming live brings some degree of, of uncontrollables, be that with the, the internet at large, the internet at our end, at your end. We've rehearsed and everything has gone very smoothly, but I just want to reassure you that in the event of technical difficulties, we will give you all access to a full replay. So you won't miss out should there be technical issues. Now, Enterprise Week 2020 has been organised by Armagh City, Banbridge and Craigavon Borough Council and sponsored by Fibrous Broadband, who were in the news this morning, so uh, well done to them. The week is being delivered by local enterprise agencies, including Mayfair Business Centre, Armagh Business Centre, Sido, Brownlow Limited and special thanks to Kieran Cunningham and his team at Banbridge District Enterprise for all of their work on this project. These organizations have collaborated, they've come together to organize a superb suite of events in, in Enterprise Week. And of course, we got off to a flying start on Monday with former fighter pilot, Mandy Hickson. Um, sorry about that, couldn't resist that one. Um, tomorrow's Inspiring Entrepreneurs event, starting at 10 a.m., will feature some of the best business leaders from across the, the Mid-Southwest region, including Maria Mackel from Tarasis Enterprises, Shea McCrory from Electricast, and Cormac Diamond from Block Blinds. This session will cover learnings for companies of all sizes and sectors with growing relevance as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to, to impact business. Then to bring the week to a close on Friday, we're going to hear from uh, Jerry Hussey, who is a world-renowned performance psychologist, uh, and also Arma's very own Lizzie Colvin, who played a key role in the incredible achievements of the Irish hockey team, who themselves will be going to the rescheduled Olympics next year, all being well. And, and that event on Friday will focus on well-being and winning. Now, pre-registration is essential for both of these sessions. So to reserve your free place, simply go to the ABC Council website homepage and click on the Enterprise Week banner. Now, to formally open today's event, I'm delighted to hand you over to the Lord Mayor of Armagh City, Banbridge and Craig Avon Borough Council. Good afternoon. Today, Virgil McCormick and Dave Linton will reflect on their respective journeys and share the business fundamentals that have delivered sustained growth for both PKF, FPM and Madlug. Their approach is transferable to all businesses and we look forward to hearing how it helped them become multi-award winning companies that are continuing to excel despite the challenging climate. Check out the Council's website for other events available as part of Enterprise Week 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor, and well done again to ABC Council and its partners for, for their vision in pulling this week-long initiative together. 
And it's now my great pleasure to be joined by Fergal and Dave. Now, I've, I've been lucky enough to work with both of them on, on different projects, and I've learned so much from both of them. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to this event. So, so Dave and Fergal, you're most welcome. Thanks for your time, and uh, are you both keeping well? Yes, good, thanks. Good to be with you. Indeed, Kevin, glad to join you. Great, thank you. So, so I have seven very specific questions that I want to, to put to, to each of our speakers. Um, these questions will allow them to share their stories, but also the transferable lessons that, that they have learned along the way. Now, as well as my own questions, uh, I will put your, your questions to the speakers. So please do submit your questions to me using the, the Q&A button. But fellas, we're, 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 we're in Enterprise Week, we're in Global Entrepreneurship Week. So I wanted to start off with a, a, a question with a, a very strong entrepreneurial flavor and it's to explore the origins of your respective businesses. So maybe if, if we go to Dave first and then Fergal, my question is, well, basically, how did your business come about? Yeah, Kevin, so there's, there's over 40,000 children enter the care system every year. That equates to one every 15 minutes. And that's a lot of kids, even in this hour. It's four or five kids. And most of them have their belongings moved in black plastic bin bags and lose their dignity. So for me, my business came out of that. If After hearing a story of um, the realities of bin bags being used and felt I've got to fix it. And um, so that was six years ago and started um, MADLUG, which stands for Make a Difference Luggage. Um, simply using the buy one, give one um, model. So we use business. It's all about profit, but all our profit is about impacting children in care. So, um, so we've, we've created this bag brand. Every time we sell a bag, we give a bag to an incredible child in the care system because of huge value, worth and dignity. And, um, and to date, we have, we have been able to help over 20,000 kids and we have an ambition to be able to get that 40,000 children every single year. And we believe we can do that in the next three to four years. Brilliant. Thanks, Dave. Fergal, the origins of, of PKFP, PKF FPM, excuse me. Uh, how did your business come about? Yeah, well, Kevin, to be honest, I trained originally as a chartered accountant with KPMG and uh, progressed to becoming a manager. And at that stage, uh, I went on a secondment um, to the IDV, which is the predecessor uh, to invest in Ireland, uh, invest in Northern Ireland. And to be fair, I, I always had the desire, uh, I think, to start my own business. Didn't necessarily have to be an accountancy or business advisory business, but I always had that desire. I think the, the IDV experience, which I, I understand, I'm still perhaps the youngest ever, what they call principal officer in the Northern Ireland Civil Service. It gave me a tremendous insight in, in that um, I seen business, to be honest with you, and observed and did business in five continents before the age of uh, 30. And uh, as a result of that, I came to the conclusion uh, uh, in, believe it or not, the 18th of August, uh, 1991, that it was appropriate time to establish my own uh, really client-focused uh, business advisory and uh, accountancy practice. Now, it's fair to say that we were looking basically for one that would ultimately have an international uh, link uh, and would have at its heart, the complementary principles of caring and trust. And uh, we, we concluded the business didn't need to be the biggest, but it should aspire to be the best it could be. And to be honest with you, that idea of scalability was important. And I was very conscious of that, that scalability in terms of starting a business is important. When you start in your own business, your own garage or whatever, you've got to always think where it's going to be in one, three and five years time. So actually I chose, and believe it or not, you'll find this hard to believe, but if you go back to August 1991, I think you'll not find one accountancy or one legal practice with a name with initials. And I chose the name FPM, and I chose that name, which is my own personal initials. I chose that name simply because I wanted to give the impression that I, even though I was a one-man operation with no clients, that I wasn't a one-man operation and that there was potential scalability to the business. Brilliant. And well, an additional question to you both linked to the origins did, did entrepreneurship run in the family? Uh, Fergal, maybe put that one to you first. Uh, well, uh, not necessarily, but my father started off as a blacksmith. Uh, and believe it or not, he, he, he then was Trevor, and then he went and worked in Harn and Wolf uh, as a, a, on the floor as an engineer. And he then came back around 1959 and established his own relatively small uh, structural steel business. And my mother 
uh, she actually uh, uh, was in a, a business in, in one point, which was actually the funeral undertakers and the, they had the carriages then. So there was, a, to be honest, a little bit of business in, in the background. Um, however, I, I, I again would say that the, 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 that few years of the IDB had an unbelievable impact on me. And I, I came across a company which subsequently we brought to Northern Ireland called Harris Laboratories, uh, located there on the Lisbon Road in Belfast, actually. But I was put in, they were in Nebraska. I was really influenced by some things I observed in their culture when I was out visiting them. And I, I really established then, to be honest, before we started a thing called Six Core Values. And believe it or not, 29 years later, uh, those six core values have not changed materially. And uh, <clears throat> just after I opened, I was asked to speak at um, uh, the Irish Accountant Student Society uh, Conference in uh, Newcastle. And uh, they said, God, I, it was hard to believe I was going to be their keynote speaker. But anyway, all at 31 years of age. But anyway, I chose the topic. I don't care how much you know until I know how much you care. And believe it or not, that became the entire philosophy of the vision of our own business. And uh, you know, from the outset, we decided that uh, that culture of being focused on humility, uh, transparency, trust, and really strong communications uh, in the context of relevance and sustainability was key. And I suppose just to say by humility, I simply mean very simple things, aspiring to do things better, continuous improvement. And by communications, I would say that it was internal and external. And believe it or not, in 29 years, we haven't yet had a brochure. I believe internal communications are actually far more important than external. And the reason I say that is, I believe your staff are your key marketeers. And to put it bluntly, they're either your assassins or your ambassadors. So if they aren't selling the business, if we haven't communicated to them, and they haven't, we haven't agreed as a team what we're about and what is our why, then I don't think we'll ever achieve our vision. Thank you. We'll touch on some of the points that you've raised there, Fergal, as we go through the event. But, but Dave, uh, you're an entrepreneurial gene in your family. Um, no, there, there's very little business. I, no, I was 42 when I started Madlog, so um, I was a youth worker for 22 years. And um, looking back, I probably was an entrepreneur all of that time because I was always using creative ideas to find solutions and problems, but it just wasn't about generating income um, or, or doing in the, in the outworking of a business. Um, but I, I'd say my entrepreneurship and my, is, is connected to my um, dyslexia and being creative and problem solving is that it just gives me, I see problems and I want to fix them and I find solutions to problems. So um, that's kind of where I'm at now. And I've seen that throughout my whole life, but in my whole family, there's no business background. There's, you know, people were questioning like, I, for real, like you haven't got a degree in business, you know, you haven't done all this, you've no money and all of these kind of things. And um, um, but it was out of, out of concern and um, they genuinely were afraid of failure. So, and they wanted to protect me. So, but um, yeah, I've probably been an entrepreneur longer and I've realized that to be honest. Yeah. And, and today's event is, is uh, around vision and traction. Dave, um, Fergal talks about scalability, uh, even in the early days. Um, what was your original vision for Mad Logo? What did you want the business to become? Well, for me, initially, it was just, do I go back to my young people that I was a youth leader off and collect their old bags and give them to the local trust, the, the, the Southern Trust? And, and, but then when I started doing the, the reality check off the, the facts, the 90,000 children or over 90,000 in the UK and Ireland are in the care system. And that's, that people are saying that's over 100,000 now with COVID. And then you start looking at the global problem and, and actually bin bags are being used in every single country to move children. You think, well, um, I could run a marathon, I could do a bit of fundraising, get a few thousand bags, help the children in Northern Ireland here. But actually, this is a global problem. So how did I find a, a global solution? And that was when it was like, we've got to do this in a business format, create a brand and create a global brand. We haven't really reached out of, North, um, out of the UK yet because we really want to work it, you know, make it work in our location here um, before we before we go elsewhere, because what's important to us is people carrying it and young people um, receiving it in the same place. So there's a real non-verbal communication of care in our brand. So, but the vision was there, I wrote it down. It was like, you know, to be the most generous and, and empowering bag brand in the world. And we set out to do that. And, and, and I believe we'll get there. And, um, but we didn't start there. We've, we've basically just started trying to really build it in a local context. Okay, thank you. 
And Fergal, uh, oh Fergal, actually, could you move your microphone a little bit closer or maybe turn your volume up slightly? Um, that, that would be great. Thank you. Um, you'd mentioned scalability. I think uh, PKFFPM now employs around 120 people. Um, did you envision that type of scalability is, is the first part of my, my next question. And then the, the second part is, is around early momentum. How did you generate sales in year one? And I, I remember a story you told me about going for a newspaper. Maybe you would reference that. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't envisage we'd have 120 staff. What I did envisage was that I believe a business that is based on one person is a very risky business. Because uh, if you take a barrister, it's a, it's a separate thing. You build up quite significant income with the knowledge that you're the only earner. However, in any other business I'm, I'm involved with, I believe a one-person business is a very difficult business because once you're knocked down, there is no business. You have no goodwill. So actually, uh, I always concluded it needed to be scalable. I didn't envisage, to be honest, it would be 120 staff or five offices. However, it's fair to say that it was interesting because when I started, we're getting to the second part of your question, perhaps, you know, I didn't, it was unusual coming from public sector, albeit I'd been in private sector to establish an accountancy practice and business was very unusual because actually most people would come from practice. So whenever I opened up, I hadn't one client, not one client. So basically the newspaper story, what I decided to do was I, uh, I picked the furthest news agent shop from the office and every morning, first thing in the morning, and every afternoon, just after lunch, I walked to that shop and bought a newspaper. And on the way back and the way there, I kept my eye out for any potential clients or contacts. And quite a few people said, oh, you're back home now, you're working. I said, yeah, how you doing? I'm very busy. And I'm back and I read the newspaper. But the point was, at least I learned from that very early moment that life and indeed business is all about people and relationships. And therefore, that, that was a sound bed. It's also fair to say that it did influence me in that not starting off with any clients meant we had to sit down and think, what are they going to do? And we really did design from day one uh, a very aggressive uh, growth revenue strategy, which was twofold. One, to be honest with you, was to target uh, niche public sector consultants at the start because cash flow, we thought they'd be able to pay us. Uh, and secondly, believe it or not, we, we targeted specifically uh, the private sector consultancy, non-recurring consultancy assignments in terms of uh, business plans, because of my pre previous experience with IDB, uh, bank proposals and tax advisory work. And the reason we did that was we set out a target that we try and convert 80% of all that non-recurring work into recurring clients within three years. Uh, and that strategy worked well, but we hadn't a client. The day I opened the business, I hadn't one client. What gave you the confidence to, 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 to give it a go, given that reality? <clears throat> well, what gave me the confidence? I, 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 fear isn't part of my DNA, to put it bluntly. And uh, look, what could happen? All that could happen was it didn't work. I'd do something else. You know, to, uh, I think it's so important to, to, to allow uh, what I would call uh, uh, intelligent failure in a mature society. We should never be afraid to take risks. That's not saying we should assess the risk, certainly, uh, but never be afraid to take risks. And, and Dave, to explore the, the early momentum of, of Madlog, uh, there are stories of crowdfunding and, and, and even Richard Branson. Um, would you mind sharing some of those stories about the, the first year or two of Madlog's existence? Yeah, so I, I started this with 500 pounds and no, um, no more money than that. And the 480 pounds of that was basically covering Kevin the, the deposit to get the brand designed. And I intentionally did that. As a youth worker, I could design stuff, but I, I knew I had to learn to give away. There was a cost. Otherwise, I would micromanage every part of the business. So one of the things was if I can't give the brand into a proper company, I can't, I'll, I'll struggle to, to do other areas of the business and give that away. Because um, when you work in a youth work context, you basically have to do it all on low budgets. And um, so that was very key. But so then that started us on the, the, the kind of thing with, that you, you mentioned about vision. For me, money always follows vision. It's, it's never the other way around. You know, you have a vision, you go for it, you get the goodwill of people, people get excited about it, customers come along and, and the money starts investors don't invest before they see something and, um, and have a vision of that. So for us, for me, it was just a matter of starting one bag at a time and build it up. But a real key point in that was year one, 
um, I was at a place where I'd taken a part-time job to try and keep myself afloat and the family afloat financially. And, um, but it, it was really struggling to run two visions, you know, and in, in youth work to kind of keep a, a young people excited and, and grow something and expectations there. And I, all I want to do was grow Madlog. And um, I got a phone call um, as I, I just handed my notice in to the part-time job and said I was going. And um, I got a phone call from the, a journalist in The Guardian saying, you've just been listed as one of the um, 15 new radicals for, the, for, the, for, for Britain. Basically, um, it's on social impact and innovation. It's going live on Sunday. We need the interview. You can't tell anybody. And that just took us to the next level. And, and I would say every year, we have had those next levels. So the following year, it was a crowd funder that we, I entered a competition, didn't even realize it was entering the competition. And it resulted in raising 24 and a half thousand pounds um, and getting brunch with Richard Branson. And then the following year, it was a, uh, an influencer just picked up a bag, put it on her Instagram and suddenly, you know, we sold out. And that was a real tipping point for us um, that, that took us for the, you know, we were able to add staff and, move to our own premises and do that so um those were kind of real key moments to to that but it was all built on it always followed the vision and if there were if, if people weren't following then you've got to ask is the vision strong enough uh, and that was the kind of the testing ground and and I, I at the time with no business background i felt um if if i had half a million pounds or two hundred thousand pounds to, to to buy stock and to get all that stuff but I look back and I think the biggest gift I had was not having that resource because it made me more innovative, creative. And actually, I probably would have um, hired, um, used the facilities. I'd have probably set it up as year 10 of the vision because I could see the painting as a visionary. I could see the painting finished, but didn't always see the stages it needed. And um, so I'm actually thankful I didn't have all that money at the start because I probably wouldn't be in business today if I, if I had. Yeah. And, and, and Dave, you mentioned some of the, the, the pivotal moments or the, or the tipping points in, in your early journey. Um, Fergal, could I ask you to describe, or talk us through three pivotal moments um, within your business journey and, and perhaps explain the importance of each? I think to be fair, Kevin, to be honest, my life and indeed the, the life of PKFFPM has been a journey of uh, learning experiences and uh, you, you certainly, I think you also learn more from your mistakes, by the way. But recognizing, I, I suppose, in the, pretty early on, we started to recognize that uh, winners across various sectors, I'm always interested in watching what people are doing in different sectors, different forms of life, sports, charity, et cetera. And, and I, I concluded that pivotal to their success actually was the competencies, competencies and outputs of their people, talent management. Uh, and therefore, believe it or not, we implemented a deliberate change in our own vision marketing strategy in that we changed the strategy from the practice brand to the employee brand. And believe it or not, if people look subtly over the last five, seven, 10 years, they'll see that we have gone very strong on employee brand. And the reason we've done that is we honestly believe that, w that if we, are, if we attract, develop and retain the best staff. Ultimately, that will enable us to exceed customers' expectations and ultimately to care and help customers achieve their lifetime aspirations. So very, very important. And I suppose in that context, I didn't realize it early on, but it, it, it was the fact that Patty Hardy, who was my first employee after just six months, you know, very rare. I certainly didn't have the work to justify a second chart accountant, but I heard about this great young lad uh, who I knew his family, who was about to come back from UCD and hit the, hit the, hit the public. And I said, well, Let's take this qualified chart accountant and see will he join us. And uh, I've always believed from that, very simple, go out and get the best people. If you have no turnover, they'll get a fee. If you have, if there's something wrong with your processes, they'll decide how to improve them. But the key is if you don't do the best people, it won't work. So people, uh, number one. Number two, I think probably, and this is one in hindsight, uh, uh, I certainly wouldn't wish it. And, uh, and uh, it's only as I go back in hindsight and try and compare myself and observe what happened. I think that the, the fact that uh, my wife my, my and myself had a, a very severely disabled child, Seamus born in 1984, was severe, very nearly off the rector scale in terms of autism. Uh, and secondly, uh, unfortunately, Anne turned out thankfully very successfully to recover, but had a serious uh, brain tumor operation in 2000. And I think those two instances put life in perspective for me. Uh, and, and what did that mean? That meant, I can tell you from March 2000, I've never lost a blink of sleep. 
do the business. And uh, I, I didn't appreciate the time, but when I talked to others, I think in hindsight, uh, that positivity uh, w was very important. And, and, and gaining somewhere in my culture that, and I think if you look at Northern Ireland, you can see this, that looking back in anger actually achieves nothing. It only affects yourself. So that was really important. And I suppose that then brought me on to really encouraging a culture uh, along with colleagues within the practice of really disengage, you know, really uh, demanding that my clients disengage, from, that my staff colleagues disengage from negativity. We just don't allow negativity. And uh, uh, that's a really significant point, I think. And um, then thirdly, I, 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 uh, I would suggest basically that um, about six years ago, maybe seven years ago, uh, I've always believed that it's very important believe it or not, to go and, and read or observe thought leadership. So I took myself off to Montreal uh, to the uh, what was called then the PKF International Thought Leadership Gathering. No conference, gathering. Anyway, I took myself off and little did I know, the get, I had, if I'm being honest, I hadn't really even looked at the, uh, uh, the agenda for the event. I just feel let's get out there, meet people, see what they're doing in China or America or whatever. Once you take the skins off, most businesses are the same. I just like to hear what people are doing. So anyway, I went out, and the, the, key, the keynote speaker was a guy called uh, uh, Gino, Gino Wickman. Now, I had never heard of Gino Wickman before, but between you and me, his speech was all about, um, it was really inspirational, but it was all about this new book he had written there called Traction and uh, you know, getting a grip of your business. And it had a major impact on me. I came back to the, to, to the practice and... Uh, I think some of my people said, what the hell happened to you in Montreal? But anyway, I bought them all a copy of the Traction book and uh, we agreed we'd read it over a weekend and come back. And that was it. And we came back and to be honest with you, we changed uh, a lot of the culture. I think to be fair, the simple culture we had already in the, in the business. I wouldn't say we adopted 100%. We didn't. But we have adopted many of the principles within it. And it has been transformational, I think. Uh, and we've certainly applied it with some clients as well. So yeah, that, that would be the third, if I'm being honest, probably the, the third pivotal moment in, in terms of uh, changing direction of the business. Great. Well, thank, thank you for sharing all of those and, and also for, for referencing the, the book Traction. I suppose in some ways uh, that book is something that, that unites the three of us. Fergal, it was, it was um, within one of your presentations that I first encountered that book and uh, Dave and I get into conversation over the summer about it and, and Dave has become a, um, I suppose, a, a champion of it or a big supporter of it. So to you both and Dave, maybe, maybe starting with you, uh, why do you like the, the, the concepts within the book Traction and, and in particular the entrepreneurial operating system? I think for me, Five years into the business, I had got to a place where, and I, in reflection to my, my overall career um, in different places, you get started. I love starting things. And, um, and for me, then it was getting to a place where I could see the vision. But then as you're put, needing all of the bits and put into business as you're growing. And I, I felt the last probably year and a half since that, since that influencer sent us as Farrell, we got, a, we got about a year out of that. We started the plateau. It was kind of a sense of, I don't know how to grow this to the next level. And, um, and then you start getting into that place of quick fixes. So you, you start thinking, well, if I do this or go here, and, and you're chasing everything with no, no plan, no, no kind of map in place how to do it. And, um, and so for me, I kind of got to the places, I need to share, I need to think through the next part of the vision in a bit more detail rather than just the big picture. And so whenever... I kind of had the conversation with you and you had said, oh, there's this book Traction that we've used. And I went off and read it. It just made sense because it, what, it, what it did was it wasn't just a, a business plan and you've got it and you work it out yourself. It wasn't just a, you know, a, a, a canvas model that you've just got a piece of paper and you've got to put it all in. It actually has all of the stuff that actually helps you implement it. So it starts with a really strong roadmap, helps you understand how to get the right people into that how they understand your own leadership skills in that. And so we um, started putting that together. And for me, um, you know, one of the real challenge, one of the real excitements of this was um, at a time when we chose, like, and this is huge for a small little social enterprise that often social enterprises aren't taking serious business, that we actually 
didn't furlough any of our staff. We, we, you know, we, we couldn't even go for the funding that was put in place to support us because we actually won and, uh, and we're being successful because social enterprise is, is actually as good as any other business out there. And so for us, what, what it was, was we had taken that courage. We had ran direct in the staff. We were in business. Let's make business work. And, um, and then we put the plan of the, the EOS stuff to, in the traction stuff. And, um, and started to put a plan, what's 10 years from now looking like? And, and out of that, we, we, we came into a place within two months of our first year, and this was only back in, in June, within, by the end of um, August, we had just sealed uh, a contract to deliver that actually took us to our turnover target of year three. Now, why does it matter is that in year three, we had a clear plan in place on staffing, on what our team needed to look like. I didn't have to go and say, oh, with all this profit and let's, how are we gonna use it and how do we build? The plan was in place, we just moved it forward. And, um, and that was because it's given me a roadmap, uh, a strategy in place, but then it goes in, why I really like it is it then gives you the components is, I'm a visionary and I'm getting exhausted doing integrator stuff. So it's given us a place where I'm looking somebody to come in and go, I need somebody to help execute this vision to take. So what Fergal sent, people are the key. And, um, and that's been a huge part. So that for me is why I believe in it. It's given me a structure as a creative entrepreneur, visionary, to actually see that I can actually scale this to this vision that, that I have from day one. And uh, Fergal, would you have anything to add in terms of the, your, your thoughts on traction in the entrepreneurial operating system? Yeah, look, I, I, I think there's no myth about it. The, the great thing about the traction system, the entrepreneurial operating system, and we call it the EOS system, the great thing about it is it's simple. You know, it, it provides a powerful, practical, simple system for running your business. And I'll be honest with you, uh, there's no theory in it. To me, it's black and white. You know, whenever I read it, it's the first, and I, I read a lot of business books, but it was the first book that I'd say, Excuse the, the, the language, there's no theory shite. It actually got you straight to running. I could identify a lot of the issues in the business. And the six components you thought about, I don't know why I hadn't thought of them before, uh, but the six components were fundamental because, you know, if you think about it, well, we know about the importance of vision, but, but having it all on one page, this vision traction organizer, every one of my colleagues, all 120 colleagues, go and ring them any day, any moment of the day, they'll be able to produce for you immediately, just there and then. Our business plan, it's on one page. It's our vision, traction, organizer. That includes our core values, our core focus. Uh, you know, it includes our marketing strategy, or what we consider to be our uniques. It includes where we think we want to be in one, two, and three, five years. It includes the measurements. This is all on one page, the KPIs. And more importantly, it then also comments, what does it look like? What do we think it's going to look like? in one, three, and five years. That's very powerful in terms of a vision. Then you move on to people. It all makes sense. But this GWC, which I hadn't come across before, you know, do people get it? Do they want it? Do they have the capacity to do it? Overnight, we brought in this people analyzer. So every staff appraisal I do, at the end of it, you take it from me, GWC, do they get a plus or a minus? Do they get it? Do they want it? Do they have the capacity to do it? Similarly, every interview I do, re-recruitment, and every interview is done in the firm, GWC. And, you know, this is really important because what this taught me is you hear all this jargon, but it's very simple. If you have the right people in the wrong seats, you can sort it out. But if you have the wrong people in the right seats, in my experience, you're better parting company immediately. You know, so uh, there will be simple stuff like that. Then, you know, on to obviously data and process. Again, a lot of what they were saying, you know, was common sense, but it did put it together in a structure. And finally, I, I think the most important thing, actually, believe it or not, was, was the title of the section, the component called issues. And believe it or not, they call these IDSs. And again, it sounds simple, but basically these issues is that uh, and we focus on identify what we think the issue is, then discuss it, solve it, and how we're gonna prioritize it. Really, once we have that chat, we decide what's our priorities. And the thing that then pulls it all together was traction. It's the glue, the, the joined up of all those components. But to be fair, simple stuff. Like, you know, we always find it difficult to find time to go into a meeting outside in the office hours. Or, you know, oh, no, 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 that's too, we're too busy. Busy fools, maybe, but we were busy. And all we have is people. Ironically, the day we decided to commit to traction, from that day, we actually, 10 senior people take four days a year, every quarter, believe it or not, we take a day outside the office. Ironically, since we started doing it, 
we've generated more business and we've made more money. And yet, we've actually prevented selling or doing anything for four days a year. Out of our most productive resource, all we do is actually ultimately sell outputs via time. And the other thing I'd say is that it convinced me, and I'm more convinced this than I ever about apply it in various not-for-profit organizations I'm in. I adopt the 90-day clock, the rocks. And really, the, the problem basically is 90 days is a very short time. If you get to, in our organization, we have rocks across the practice and we have rocks with various subdivisions. You can't hide. Once you agree that this is what you're going to do in the next 90 days and your name's beside it, you can't run away. I can tell you, all of a sudden, it might be the first quarter, but it'll never happen again. You'll be very quick to know. I don't mind if you ran up the mountain and back. If that's not one of the rocks, you can talk about that later. You'll be asked, how did you get on with a rock? Full stop. <laughs> right. It focuses the mind, I can tell you. <laughs> yes, yeah, I would agree. Accountability goes through the roof. Um, and it, just break for a, a quick second to remind um, everyone else on the call at the event, please do submit your questions and I'll put them to, to Fergal and Dave in a few minutes. Uh, so just in case people think we're, we're, we're on commission from Gino Wickman, um, I should, I sh I'm going to ask you both, are there, is there one other business or developmental book that you have gifted most or you would recommend? And, and one additional question that I'm asking everyone this week, um, one book of fiction that you've, you've most gifted or you would recommend? I'll go to uh, Fergal first. Well, I'll answer the second part first of all. I have to tell you, I don't think I've ever read a fiction book, so there you go. I apologize for that. I'm very big into sports, uh, sports books and autobiographies. In terms of another book, yeah, I love the Legacy book, the All Blacks book. Um, I, I, uh, that, that's a book that I could identify with, and uh, you know, I, I thought a lot of the cultures in that book were transferable to every form of life. So that, that would be the book I, I, I got it a few years ago when it came out, and um, I have to say uh, I like a lot of what's in it. Okay, if you could recommend one uh, autobiography, which would it be? Well, I suppose they're all different. Um, I have to say, I, if I was going to the future, I've just seen the serialization of the Obama autobiography, and that looks very impressive. Uh, but no, look, I, I, I have read various autobiographies, and uh, I, I think you pick up something from every one of them, particularly the, the sports ones. I think they're, I, I love sports autobiographies because actually I think the parallels between sport and business are so obvious. And really, when you see, you know, it's uh, determination, it's, uh, you know, persistence. So you can see all the common traits coming through. And it's amazing when you get in and just see the personal stuff. Uh, it's philosophy. So I, rather than name one, I'd say, if I'm being honest with you, most of the leading sports autobiographies I read. And yeah. uh, I enjoy them. And, and Dave... Uh... If, if you're a if you're a fiction reader, a book of fiction, and one other developmental book, yeah, uh, fiction. I'm not a fiction. I've never read a book either, um, and that's partly my dyslexia, is that I have got to have a purpose in what I read. So I've got to learn something. So so I generally read um, business leader books, autobiographies of people who have made a difference, changed, um, and I think that one for me is the um, the the story of Tom's. Um, do something, start something that matters, um, the Tom Shoe Company, which we took a lot of the ideas around how we do business from that autobiography. As far as um, business books, um, we, um, for me, the, the thing that has shaped our, our brand is a, a book called Building a Story Brand by Donald Miller. And, and it's been just putting, the, learning how to put the narrative of our story, of our business, and it's not just because we're a social brand. I mean, they, 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 they coach companies in every area to basically how to market, how to tell their story. But the simplicity is this, that um, it's learning to be the guide in the story rather than the hero. And, and that's a, that's a, you know, and that's really hard when you're winning awards, you know, is that you become the hero, you become the person on the papers and everyone's focused on you. And actually you have to learn quickly to get off that, that platform and become the guide. Let's, let's guide our customers into being the heroes. So in our case, it's um, people don't need to start another mad lug. We have found the solution here. Now we've, we, we introduce the problem and we, we give them a, a solution for them to be the hero out of their purchase. So it's a simple, a simple, simple, and it's using basically the storyline of film 
that every every story's got a hero, every story's got a villain. What's the villain that we're trying to deal with in our story? And starting to to put that that down, and that has been so in, instrumental to to us. We would I would be as much a purist in story brand as I am in the US as a structural, um, running the business part. Okay, great. Uh, we'll move one more question from me, and then I move into the, to the audience uh, question. So around guiding principles. What is the best piece of, of business advice uh, that you have received? And, and if you don't mind sharing who, who it was from, we'll maybe go to Fergal first on that one. Well, I would say in terms of maybe the individual, it was Mark, Dr. Martin Ockman's advice. I had the honor of sitting on a board of Martin Ockman, the founder of Dendentics for about seven or eight years. And uh, he, also said, he always said, never be complacent and retain a sense of uh, nervousness. And uh, he said, you think maybe you're, maybe you're a fish or some type of competition as a child, you're always that nervous, but actually you need to be nervous. And the, you, you hear that in sports so often. I suppose I'd also say that I can't really say the actual individual, but there's a couple of constant themes uh, that uh, people have said to me, um, you know, I, I, maybe I picked up myself and developed, but I do think you should stay in the present, you know, focus on your current role and endeavor to do the best you can be and try and make every moment count. And the reason why I say that is, you know, it's amazing, but you will be spotted. You know, don't look too far ahead because you'll never, you won't catch it, you know. And they focus on what you're doing now and do it the best of your ability. And that type of culture uh, will, will see you through. I think the other thing I'd, I'd add, I suppose, in terms of my own view uh, in that context would be that um, uh, if I'm reading CVs, right, I immediately go to extracurricular activities. And oh, I don't think you can turn the clock on are off at five o'clock. I'm always looking for caring or leadership. I'm, look, I'm looking not for the solo player, but the team player. I'm looking for the captain. I'm looking for the treasurer. I'm looking for the volunteer, whether it be Salvation Army or whether it be somebody said the call. I'm looking, and in my own case, I'd say, and I, again, it's hindsight, the fact that I was very actively involved as a volunteer from 16 years of age on in various organizations and was perhaps chairing some committees that all my subordinates were older than myself, that actually stood me in very good case when I am went into business, particularly IDB, whenever virtually everybody who was on my team was young, was older than me, uh, that, that I was leading. But you know, I think you always try to apply life's experiences and looking around life to bring you forward. I, I don't think you can put it into boxes. And, and Fergal, before I hand that question over to, to Dave, when you were either seeking out uh, roles as as chair or volunteering roles um, how did you go about seeking them out how did you know which ones to how did you decide which ones to, to choose to to uh, contribute to and which ones not to well i'm not sure i was so deliberate to seek them out to be honest with you i just got involved i always loved volunteering i mean you know if i look back at 16 i was the the, the senior PRO of Warren Point Golf Club. I was the chairman of the Down GA Youth Board. You know, you know, it's, it's only when I look back, I see, you know, I didn't see at the time, you know, I was whatever it was, the, uh, you know, and not for one moment, I learned it from people around, but, you know, I was the inaugural chairman of the, my school golf club, golf team. I was the inaugural president of Accountancy Society of Queens. I, I, I sort of can't tell you why that happened, but I always felt it was good to get a few friends around or a few people around and say, look, why don't we go and try and do something? And uh, personally, uh, I think it was St. Francis who said that the door to happiness opens outwards. But, but I do think, uh, perhaps from those experiences, that I always learned that it was in giving you receive. And I think that if you're a volunteer and a team player, as a, you know, I, I think you want very ambitious people in your team, but you don't want solo players. And, and you can see those solo ones. So to be honest, Kevin, I never went out of my way to find any position, because actually I think that's the wrong way to do it. But I think if you help and care, it's amazing where that road takes you and you would never envisage where that could be. And Dave, the, the best piece of, of business advice that you have received and, and if you don't mind sharing who it came from. I, th I think um, I, was, I was thinking through all of the, you know, it's, it's so much advice I get. I think one of the real key moments was at the start of, um, of lockdown in March, you know, have a no business background um, with a big vision, and not and, and hearing the media go on everybody locked down shut down you know um put out your offload your your crew for a while um protect cash and um 
And, and I was probably listening to a lot of that, but with a desire this doesn't feel right. And one of my board members, um, who's an experienced business guy, uh, Alan Taylor, basically said, You're, we're either in business or we're not. And, 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 and that was kind of like, for me, a bit of advice is like, the, the, it's the same result at the end. You know, we, we either lose at the end of the storm getting beaten or we lose by stopping. And, um, but we're either in business or we're not. So let's just keep going. And, um, and that, that for me has been, it, it was like a, such a, an empowering comment that gave me courage, that's given me courage since then to, to really see a way forward, to embrace the EOS, to, to have a big, bigger dream, to see the vision actually start to become reality. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to put some questions to you from, from the attendees. So, um, Jared McGivern asks, uh, or points out, it is interesting that both speakers came from public sector roles. Do you believe there are opportunities to encourage more enterprising public servants to take the leap uh, into industry? Well, I'm not sure I've ever been described as a public sector person. I, I, uh, I certainly, uh, probably the, the hardest I ever worked probably within those three years, but I, I think I also made the best of it. I, I think uh, my wife would confirm that I was working 60, 70 hours a week and on planes a lot of the time. But uh, look, I, I think that there are strengths in all sectors, whether they be the private sector, the public sector, or, or the, the not-for-profit sector. I think what is important is that it definitely is very good to diversify your skill base and your experience base. Uh, and therefore, certainly the public sector allowing career breaks of two years or three-year career breaks now and again is a very good way to test the water. Um, I think there's one thing about the private sector, you don't have the security basket of the public sector and maybe a mix of somewhere in between. I think uh, you can see at times within the public sector, uh, unfortunately, creativity being stifled and bureaucracy taking the lead. Uh, so it's somewhere in between. And maybe when you're in it for a while, you see opportunities to change. And equally, when you're in the private sector, you observe good things about the public sector. So I think if you can take the best experiences from various forms of life's experiences uh, and apply them. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't see myself as a public sector worker. Um, being in youth work probably is, you know, you're every, every day is a new day and every, every issue you're dealing with is a new issue. So for me, it was doing what I'm doing is just a continuation of what I was doing um, in, in, the, in the youth work space. It's just the difference is that I'm having to generate income to enable us to do the social good. We have a great uh, anonymous question has come in. In this environment, when you can't get out to meet people, uh, do you have any suggestions for how a startup business can develop relationships, given that it is so much more difficult to show your personality and your passion when not meeting people face to face? Uh, Fergal, any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, again, if we get back to basics, I mean, you know, we can't control what happens around us, but we can control how we respond and individual actions make a difference. So in that context, to be fair, you know, networking used to be all about meeting people face to face, but it's now becoming a lot more sophisticated. You could nearly call it now, it's, 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 it's meet and touch in that you may be using technology to help you network. You may be using LinkedIn, you may be using uh, astute social media. I'm not talking about um, what I would say, the, uh, you know, the raspberry jam effect spread everywhere. No, 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 a very focused, uh, marketing. So believe it or not, I wouldn't get hung up. Uh, personally, I love people. I love meeting people. But, you know, uh, you adjust to the circumstances. And certainly, um, I believe that I've learned new skills I never thought I'd have. If anybody said to me that I'd be doing most of my business on Teams or Zoom uh, or Skype, and I, and I said, go and catch yourself on. However, uh, I have seen uh, positives. Now, ultimately, I think we all love to get back to meeting people more and more physically, but we just have to adapt. And the key to any business is to be agile and just be smart. Sit, I mean, what I would say to that person is go for a walk, clear your head out and say, <clears throat> what do I want to achieve? And then the next question we all must ask in business, which is we haven't really come to it, but it's the most important, is why? Why would somebody want to buy my product or service? And in very simple terms, that's back to benefits as opposed to features. And again, I'm a very simple person. I believe there's only three benefits. And if my product or service, if it doesn't save somebody time, if it doesn't make them money or if it doesn't make the, give them more peace of mind, it's not worth telling them about it. 
So find out who might meet the requirements of why my product or service is a benefit to them, and then start focusing it. And I, I, I personally believe the person who goes after things, it'll happen. The one sure thing is, if you sit in your ass and do nothing, it won't happen. So I wouldn't get hung up with the fact we can't meet people. I look forward to meeting them again and maybe think of what I'm going to do when I do meet them again and how I'm maybe going to learn from the experience of present to be more time effective and that I didn't you know, up to now, probably in the last two or four years, I've spent uh, uh, maybe 75% of my time in the car. My car is my office and I'm, yeah, I'm always talking to people through my, you know, my car, my hands off car, phone my ad. But the point I'm making is that this has been a learning experience for me. Uh, I've probably filled my car three times since, since early March. So, uh, but things haven't collapsed. I've had to adopt new ways. And I'd say that to the person who made the query. Have confidence in your own ability to meet whatever challenges that arise. Okay. I'll, I'll, the questions are flying in here, so I'll move swiftly through them. So Patty Grimes asks, from your own experiences, is there one thing whilst running your own business that you would advise people not to do or to avoid? Um, what would it be and why? Dave, could I ask that one to you? I, I think the, the key is, is you need to have, um, you know, you need to, you need to get people around you who are mentors. I, you know, no, no more than you better because the, the whole area of running your own business can be quite lonely. Leadership can be quite lonely in the sense that, you know, even with staff around, you start having to, to make decisions and how, how that grows. So um, for me, the thing is, don't don't just isolate yourself is the is the key thing of business, but actually get key people around you. Thank you, Fergal. Yeah, I, I think I probably concluded that uh, people won't remember perhaps what you told them or what you did. They'll remember how you made them feel. So if I'm being honest with you, I think that is fundamental, and uh, you you got to remember that. And it's amazing if you talk to somebody. Uh, 20 years afterwards, they can still recall whether well, it was a school teacher or somebody who did, who, that person in their own mind probably never realized. You know, I remember I had a school teacher one time, he said to me, McCormick, the only, uh, the only O level you'll ever get is golf. Now, that man was a very nice man. And by the way, he followed my career and uh, he couldn't have been nicer to me. But he doesn't realize that has always, in the back of my mind, I remember that comment. So, what I'm saying to you is, if he had come up and perhaps put his arm around me and said, here, you need to be careful, that golf's great, but you know, maybe you need to give the books a wee bit of time. So I'm coming back to saying that, you know, maybe as I get older, I'm beginning to appreciate that, you know, it's how you make people feel is more important. And then indirectly, you get your message through. Yeah, thank you. There are two questions that have come in here. In the interest of time, I'm going to combine them. And they're in the was the context of the of the pandemic um, so any tips to maintain a good work-life balance and then what techniques activities recently have you adopted to, to generate ideas or clarity uh, Dave yeah um, as I said we we chose not to um, not to furlough we we went with it um, we couldn't. There was some of the things we had to we had to to make changes. I think for me, as a small small um, yeah, it's a relatively small business, is that um, is that you the last thing you need to do is is lose your people. They are your crew. You know you can't win a football match without a team. You know you can't you can't um, win a war without an army. You know there's 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 you know so for me it was a matter of keeping keeping that, but it was the. I would like to say it was all really strategic, but actually my experience of it been is that it was the reaction of every wave. And it was only after you got to a bit of calm over the summer and you started doing reflection on actually, how did we do? How did the figures end up? That then you start to realize actually we won. We, 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 we were successful in getting through that without it really impacting our business. Um, but I, I don't know how I did it. Uh, there's no fancy strategy. It was just literally, you know, you start making the right choices when you're under the pressure and, and you haven't got time. You're holding onto the rudder of the boat and you're, you haven't got time to go, you know, down below and do your figures and your accountant and make phone calls and talk all day. And, um, you know, I, I think that. And the last thing I think, and I've been giving this a lot of thought, is that I think there was a real risk for us as business leaders to get into a victim mindset 
and I tell you why I think the mindset is there is that we, we could have spent, if, if we think through the amount of time that we talk doom and gloom and negativity, as Fergal says, isn't allowed, we, we could talk negative about the impacts of this and we could spend hours and hours and hours. But if we actually took those hours and actually started thinking through, could we get a connection on a LinkedIn call or Zoom call or you know, an introduction to here and start thinking of new ways to, to, to do your business? Um, that, that, I think that would have, you would have found probably a lot more creativity. And in fact, we, one of the first things we did was we're a bag company. We weren't really selling bags, but we, and we had a, we had a staff member who had an arts degree who finishes our bags, but we weren't bringing stock in for her to finish. So in theory, you know, she had no job, but we thought, how do we keep her employed? She was pregnant due to her maternity. How do we keep her employed? And we designed a, a mad log activity book, told the whole story and, and put it out. Did it sell? Not really. But do you know what it did? It created, it, it gave a, a sense of creativity, empowerment to my staff and, and it educated. We got, we got some PR from that um, more than sales that people then started to hear about Madlug through those kind of channels. So I would say there's no strategy. It was just a matter of being prepared to take those kind of responses and keep holding on the rudder as a leader, yeah. responding to the, the circumstances. For what it's worth, Dave, my children love the, the workbooks. Uh, so <laughs> thank They're you. For, yeah, yeah. Fergal, um, in the in the during COVID world, any observations on on work life balance, looking after yourself, and and techniques that you adopt to generate ideas or clarity? Yeah, look, I think first of all we have to accept we're living in extraordinary times at present, and you know you think about it, it's all extraordinary because there are three uncertainties. There's the uncertainty about the pandemic itself, there's the uncertainty about the business, and then there's the uncertainty about people's changing behaviours and attitudes. So, in that context. Uh, again, just like uh, Dave, we, 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 we just, we were who we are and we had to move. And uh, what we did was, to be fair, and you know, I, I'm not, we didn't plan this, but what we did was we upped the communications dramatically. So much so that I myself, uh, every Monday morning, uh, initially now it's bi-weekly at present actually, but for the first 20, 10, 15 weeks, it was every Monday morning uh, at nine o'clock uh, via a YouTube, private YouTube. We, we spoke to all 120 staff in terms of providing a single update. Uh, and they could come in on it from whether it be computers, uh, phones, whatever. And amazingly, what we found out was the amount of people coming in, unless they were dead, they were virtually there, which they weren't asked to, but they were all there. The other thing is, I think one of our cult core cultures has been, right through, has always been to adopt a family attitude. And we say that once a member, once an employee, always, doesn't matter where you go, you're always a member of our family. And we do encourage staff, to be honest with you, to develop friendships with staff uh, and relationships both in and outside of work. And thirdly, which may not go down well, uh, but I'll give you my explanation for it. Uh, I'm not a buyer in the work-life balance as some people interpret it. Uh, I have never, um, I have never not wanted to do something that I felt I need to do for my family or for myself. Uh, I believe the, the two complement each other. So if, I, if it's during normal work hours and I want to go to a football match to see my young lad play, or I just go. If I have an appeal, I just go. I expect my staff to do the same. I don't give a damn. I always do their work. I don't mind when they do it. So actually, to be upfront about it, I don't buy this turn off the clock at five o'clock. I actually think it's disaster. I think it's the opposite. Now, obviously, there is a risk uh, within uh, a home environment working all the time. You may forget. To, to stop working with that. I, I don't think if you get back to the right culture, that should never happen. I think personally, uh, it has been good for me. Uh, I've, uh, I've certainly got more fresh air uh, than uh, I got in the past. And, uh, you know, I think it's, you know, uh, from a family point of view, it's been great. But you know, I, I come back to this. If we get into the positive enough mind and say, look, we are who we are, what do we do now? And certainly in terms of the business, we've secured, how to put this politely, our new development has never in 29 years been more proactive and more rewarding than the last eight weeks. And that's because we all knew we had to do something different. So all our 120 people, they were coming up with OFIs, Opportunities for Improvement. Now we also do a, a weekly staff pulse survey, which actually gets people's feelings, how they're feeling. How, how, uh, how, how's it going today? Mark one to ten, and send it back to us. Uh, coordinated in Nottingham, uh, anonymously. But I, I would say the one thing we got to do is is quietly calm. The world's not going to end tomorrow, 
to come, pause, and then say, this is where we are. What are we going to do about it? And don't do it on your own. There's always people around, and we all get low moments. Make no mistake about it. Just be afraid to open up, talk to friends, talk to work colleagues, and before you know it, there'll always be help around the corner. I think, I think that's it an ideal way to finish. We're, we're at half one now. Um, so just to, to, to briefly recap on, on, on the notes that I've scribbled, um, some acronyms, GWC, get it, want it, have the capacity to, to, to deliver it, the people analyzer. Um, it's not what you say, what you do, it's how you make fe people feel. Um, and giving you receive, disengage from negativity, avoid the victim mindset, and OFI, opportunities, uh, for, for improvement OFIs, yeah. opportunities for improvement brilliant fellas look thank you so much for your time uh, it, it is very much appreciated I've, I've taken a huge amount from that and hopefully the rest of the audience have um, so can I remind everyone else be, before we go um, to take two minutes to tell us uh, what you thought of today's event uh, when you leave this meeting you'll be asked in the web page to, to click to complete a short survey this really does help us shape future events so please take the time uh, also, if you enjoyed today's event, then do register for the sessions tomorrow and Friday. It's Inspiring Entrepreneurs tomorrow at 10 a.m. And then on Friday at 12.30, it's Wellbeing and Winning with performance psychologist Jerry Hussey and Irish uh, hockey player Lizzie Colvin. Pre-registration for both is essential. So to reserve your place, simply go to the ABC Council website homepage and click on the Enterprise Week banner. So thank you once again to ABC Council and their partners um, for their work on today's event and indeed across Enterprise Week. Thanks also to our speakers. Uh, and we've seen today uh, through Dave and Madlock um, the, the impact that, that social enterprises can have on people's lives. So we're going to play you out with a short video from Social Enterprise Northern Ireland, who are the local voice of social enterprises and social entrepreneurs. So to everyone, have a great day. See you on Thursday and on Friday. And let's have a look at some of the great work being carried out across Northern Ireland. came from myself not being able to understand my brother growing up whenever he was diagnosed with autism and I wanted to give back to the other siblings but also to educate the other classmates about what somebody with autism goes through on a daily basis. So we produced educational books that outlined the children different scenarios a child with autism would have on a daily basis and these then are integrated into the classroom through our buy one give one scheme whereby we donate books to primary schools throughout the whole of Northern Ireland. Access Employment are a local social enterprise company um, established in 1999, primarily to uh, provide training and employment for adults with learning disability. And we run a number of different social enterprise activities, uh, including catering and art culture, uh, online retailing, and we also manufacture Ireland's first ethical bottled water. <laughs>
delight to be here this morning at uh, the Social Enterprise Conference uh, at the Crumlin Road Jail. This is a dynamic sector that's contributing significantly to the economy of Northern Ireland and one which continues to grow um, in uh, present challenging circumstances. Um, I wish them every success for the future and uh, pass on my support and hope that they will have an enjoyable and interesting conference today.